Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 129. It would be good to get out of this corporate business and to start something new. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, and now it's time to light it up. Hi there, it's Sue, and thank you for joining me on the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. If you're a gifter, baker, crafter, or maker, and you own a brick and mortar shop, sell online, or are just getting started, here is where you'll find insights and advice to develop and grow your business. And if you want even more Gift Biz motivation, I'd like to invite you to join our private Facebook group called Gift Biz Breeze. Pursuing your dream should be fun, exciting, and rewarding, not stressful and scary. When you join the breeze, it's like sitting in the park with friends who bring you all the support and the answers that you need. You'll have access to a group of amazing creators along with tools and resources that can catapult your business growth. To join the group, just go over to giftbizbreeze.com. I look forward to seeing you over there, but for now, let's get on to the show. I am so excited to introduce you to Klaus Hagen of Austrian Atelier. Starting out as a mechanical engineer in Austria, Klaus had no idea that he would one day be applying his expertise from manufacturing metal and steel products to creating contemporary candles. With an eye for geometric shapes, colors, and textures, and influenced by Europe's visionary artistry and quality craftsmanship, by 2006, Klaus devoted himself solely to designing one-of-a-kind candles in the United States. He works out of his own studio, which combines the quality control of his handmade candles and the opportunity to create candle art using shapes, sizes, and jewel-toned colors. Klaus is inspired by his customers who appreciate stepping out of the accelerating comet of life into an oasis of atmosphere, art, and candlelight. Welcome to the show, Klaus. Thank you. I am so thrilled to have you, and this is so appropriate because you make candles, and we're going to talk about your motivational candle today. If you were to share with our listeners a little bit more about you, but in a creative way, by describing yourself through a motivational candle, what color would your candle be, and what would be the quote on your candle? If people look up my website, all of my candles are flat candles, so they'll be different in the way how they're made. And like my motivation candle would be a round candle. The reason of a round candle is it symbolizes for me infinity, which goes round and round. So this is something. And the color depends a little bit on my mood. Like I'm more the primary colors, red, blue. So what's your color for today? What's your mood today? Today it would be more blue, I would say, because it's gray outside. And it would be nice to have a blue sky. So a round candle would be, today for me, would be the blue sky outside. Okay, perfect. And how about a quote on that candle? Like Dare to Dream is for me a nice quote. I like a lot Einstein. And like he said in German, fantasy is wichtiger als Wissen, denn Wissen ist begrenzt, which means in English, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. You can know a lot, but you never know everything. And I think... To know more, you have to use your imagination. It's like everywhere. And I think if people are too rigid in life, I think you miss out on it. I think this is why I like his quote so much. Yeah, I love that quote. Imagination is more important than knowledge. I agree. It gives us a little cause for thought there, I think. (laughs) So you have an interesting story here, Klaus. Talk to us a little bit about, were you born in Austria? Yes, I was born in Austria and I lived for over 30 years in Austria before I came over to the U.S. The reason that I came over here, I'm married to an American woman. So my wife got homesick and then we decided that it's time for her to come back over to the U.S. So we're here now for over 20 years in the United States. Wow. So you were the wonderful supportive husband and agreed to come over here. Yes, let's say it in this way. (laughs) (laughs) You say hesitantly. (laughs) So talk about Austrian atelier. And you're going to have to share with us the definition of atelier too. But talk a little bit about how the business got started. 
I started out here in the U.S. in the corporate business. Like what you mentioned before, I'm a mechanical engineer. And like 12 years ago or something, I was introduced in Europe by a friend of mine to candles in geometric shapes. And it caught my eye, especially like in Austria, we burn a lot of candles. The winter is long and it gets dark like at four in the evening. So you tend to burn like every day a candle to symbolize the warmth and the sunlight. So I was always fascinated as a kid by candle, candlelight eating by candlelight when there was a storm and there was no electricity, you would burn light, you would go hiking up in the mountains, there was no electricity in the mountains, in the huts. So it was always candlelight. And when I saw those candles, and it was at this time when I was thinking about it would be good to get out of this corporate business and to start something new, I don't know, it started to grow in my mind that uh, this would be like something, I never saw something like this before. And like for me, candles... I, I like them. So what you had been burning in terms of candles when you were a child were just the traditional shapes. And then all of a sudden you ran into some friends or acquaintances in Europe and you saw an idea of, no, it doesn't have to be the traditional shape candle anymore. Exactly. Like I saw candles, it was not what I'm making right now. They were three-dimensional, but it was also geometric shapes. I thought, wow, they're pretty cool. And they burn really nicely. So I started to go on the internet, read a little bit about this. I looked at shows for candle manufacturers. And so it got started since. It took me like a year. And after a year, I made my first candle when I had a little bit of an idea how it could look like and how to get started. And this was the beginning of the Austrian Atelier Sein. Let's stick with the product for a minute. Did you have to try and make a candle and then you saw the result and then switched it up a little bit and kept testing it till you got to the perfect look and shape and texture and all that? Yeah, like for me, it was important. It has to, had to be 100% natural. So this was the first thing. So I got the palm wax, which by the way, it's from sustainable farms or palm wax what we're using. It burns extremely clean. You can put the glass on top of it. It won't blacken it. The next step was to find the right wig. We get our wig from a company in Kentucky. It's 100% cotton. It's only cotton in there. And the first thing was really to find out how thin can I make a candle. And it still will burn clean and without dripping. So this took me a lot of tries and error because the first mold that I made was quite primitive. I put some metal together and it was a simple shape in there it was not about the shape it was only about making see the functionality so this was an interesting time for me because there was nothing out there where i could read you have to use this and this like if you make some round candles taper candles or pillar candles there's in some information out there and it will tell you use this week use this size so it was trial and error at the beginning for me to make my first candles but your candles now are so unique, which makes them so special. Explain a little bit for our listeners what your candles look like. If you can imagine like a Frisbee, it's round. It's only like three eighths of an inch thick. So it's like flat, like a plate or something. You go this way and I have rectangles, like the geometrical shapes, triangles. But everything, it's like if you would cut a sheet of paper and you cut it out. So it's uh, two dimensional. And the thickness, it's only three-eighths of an inch. It's really thin. And most people have the impressions and it will drip all over the place because the wax doesn't stay in there. But it burns really well. The wick has enough heat and it, the wax can evaporate. If there's no draft, send the candles I make will burn down without dripping. They're beautiful. They're so interesting. What's cool is that then when they burn, their shape changes because the wax where the wick is starts to burn down. They're very interesting. And Gift Biz listeners, I encourage you to go over and look on the website and see what they look like. And this is a perfect example of a way to take a product that everyone can relate to, candles, but switch it up so you're different. Nobody else's candles are like Klaus's. And so not only the shapes, the size, the texture of the candle as well. So it sets him apart in his industry of candles to be different. This is what I call when I start talking about unique selling powers. This is one of his because his product looks so different. Let's move on to talking about your name. And so we're still going back 20 years or so when you're developing and getting the product out to the market. 
How did you decide on the name of the company? I'm from Austria and the candles are contemporary European looking. My wife and I tried to find the name and then Austrian Atelier. Atelier is in Europe used for studios. So Atelier is studio? Yeah, it's like where it derives from the French and it has two meanings. It's attic. So before artists would live mostly in the attic, it was the cheapest room. There were a big window, so a lot of sun. So a lot of painters started out in Europe having their studio in an attic and did their paintings there. And then also the meaning is it's the studio of an artist atelier. So a lot of studios over there in Europe are called atelier. And I thought it's quite common in the US. My wife also told me it's common. She lived for 10 years in Austria. So then when we had the name incorporated, then all of a sudden I got those questions, what does it mean? And I thought, oops, <laughs> it's well known also over here in the US. But it's nice. People ask and people say, okay, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And it kind of creates a vision of the European type artisty attic, and the older buildings that, of course, Europe has that we don't have here. Once people understand it, it adds depth to the company, I believe. Would you hindsight say that it's a good idea to have a less common known word in your name or no? In hindsight, I would have called it differently because like it doesn't relate to the product I'm making. So if somebody goes on the internet or something, it doesn't tell them and it's a pretty long name and like everything nowadays it's internet driven so if somebody googles you or like Austin Atelier as, as an email and my email is in there it's a lot to write so it's better to keep it short and really point to your product so if I would have to redo it this would be one of the things I would do a little bit differently really good advice all right so you've got the name you've now created the product what did you do to get people to notice it for the first time? I went to a trade show. This was always oh the first time what I did. I went to one of those retail shows. Like a consumer show? Yeah, like a small one, like a Christmas show to go there. And it was a mixed success at the beginning because people were quite critical about it doesn't look like a candle. Like I had one customer who walked by four or five times and then he asked me, are those wooden plates? Because it doesn't look like a candle. Everybody thought it's perhaps something round and it's flat. It's perhaps a plate or something. So because I didn't, couldn't burn the candles at the show. So this was an interesting experience for me at the beginning. You go there as when you make things, you have the idea. People have to know the same what you know. So you can't make the assumption because you know it's a candle that your customers or potential customers will know the same. So you have to make it or present it in a way so they understand what it is. Right. So this was for me the first experience when I went out to a show. Yeah, I missed the mark. Well, or you could just say it was a learning, right? Exactly. Because you never know until you get there what the response is going to be. It's a learning experience. I think like if you start a business, it's also about persistence that you really go out there and present something and then you have to tweak it and to see and like I did the New York show for the last 10 years and the first three four shows I did in New York weren't too good people walked by looked at it and said okay it looks nice it's interesting but I didn't get too many sales out of it and I think then after two years to 30 years I could see it was picking up there was more interest. There were more sales in there. People have to get used to it. I think it's not instant gratification, which a lot of people are looking for. I think you have to give yourself a little bit of time and you have to plan it out and to say, okay, it doesn't go overnight. If it does, it's great. But with certain products, it will take a while before people start to accept it and before people are willing to look at it and give it a try. So this was my experience with my product at shows now, I don't recall, I'm thinking of your booth and I don't know that you do this. I know you can't burn them at the show, but do you bring any candles that have been used so people can see how it changes as it's burning? 
Yeah, I do a half burn samples there. And also do the last couple of years now, I have burn videos so people can really see how it burns down. It's a time lapse video. I mean, people see how it goes down and then it makes different shapes. All of a sudden, woo, it's on a different level. Like before, okay, it's different. But then when you burn it again, it adds another dimension to the candle experience. Right, for sure. What other things have you learned? Because you are a trade show pro now. <laughs> what other things or maybe some advice for people who are doing trade shows? What do you see that you need to be doing? Especially if someone's just starting out, what advice would you give them in terms of working the show or preparing for the show or anything like that? It's important that you try to get potential customers to your booths before the show starts. So you do mailings and introduce a product yourself. So you have a customer coming to your booth because like a lot of my customers, they know what they would like to purchase. So they walk the floor, but sometimes they don't watch what's really out there. They're vendors, they go there, they make the purchase and then they more or less run through there. So if you don't create an interest beforehand, sometimes a trade show can be really disappointing that so you don't have enough traction there, not enough sales. In my mind, a trade show is not anymore a selling tool by itself or it's a selling tool but it's more a marketing tool it's like you go there and you never know if a show was good during the show you have to wait a couple of months after and to see what's coming out of the show it's like either you invest in catalogs ads or something and i think if you go to trade show you also have to look nowadays it's an advertising tool you go there you make sales it's great if you make a lot of sales if not, you're out in front of people and you have to see what comes afterwards. It's like it's the same working the show beforehand. It's important this working the shows the, after the show is it's, it's over. You have contact information, you have to follow up and you have to get business out of this information you got at the show. Wonderful. Yeah, that's really good information. So just in summary, in terms of communication and working with customers at the booth, just to summarize what Klaus said is first, communicate with people before a show to make sure to put eyes on your booth. Maybe you send something that shows the booth number or what you're going to be doing at the booth. Come see the video of the candles burning and see how they change shape or something enticing to get them in. Then when you're at the show, it's not all about just the sales that you make at the show. Yes, it's great if you're able to cover your costs, but there's a lot more to it. Sometimes it's just exposure initially, especially if your product is new and different like Klaus's is. So the success of a show is not determined just right at the show. And I would say, Klaus, that's the same thing with me because my products when I'm out at shows are expensive. Our systems are $1,000. So we'll get calls now from someone who saw us at a show two years ago even. So you can't just take the sales at the show. And the third thing is follow up. Once you get cards from shows, make sure to follow up in some manner with everyone who stopped by your booth. Lots of times people get distracted at shows. And so sometimes there are people who fully intended to come back to your booth and then just didn't get a chance. And all of a sudden, then the show is over. And if you don't make contact with them, they may not have your information. So really good points there. I really appreciate all of that information, Klaus. In terms of displays, do you have any advice about displays at trade shows? Yeah, I think it's important that you have nice lights so your product is really highlighted on your booth and that you spend some time displaying your item. Especially here in the U.S., I think it's a lot about packaging and how you present your product. It's really important. So you said show your customer how they can show it to their customers and then they get an idea how they can sell it in the stores. I think this is extremely important here. All right, perfect. So besides trade shows then, what else are you doing to promote your product? Unfortunately, this is the main area of how I get my customers through trade shows. I don't do anything on the social media, which is a mistake in my mind. I think you are pretty good. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Like we are in this lucky position. We are a small company. We are only two people here. And the trade shows keeps me busy year round. So it's not something that I have a lot of time to go out. But trade shows are supporting the business then, it sounds like. They do, yeah. Like I'm doing it for the last 10 years. So I have a customer base. And even like at the last trade show, I haven't seen 
quite a few of my customers. And now the last week I got six, seven orders in from customers. I didn't see it at the trade show, so which is nice. You know, and I always can follow up with the customers I have and say, do you need candles after the show? So I have a certain base, especially for me in the fall. I'm extremely busy. I don't have a weekend off because it's the season where most people burn candles or buy candles. All right. I know you're busy because that's why we've had so much trouble <laughs> scheduling this interview because you're always out at shows and then you come back. So I have to make candles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is good. Absolutely. You don't want to be sitting twiddling your thumbs over there. That's for sure. How many shows are you doing a year? This year I did four, but I will go back to two because it seems like the customers that I have, they're mostly on the East Coast or West Coast. And the buyers, I find most of them go to New York. So for me, the New York show, it's for my product. It does the best. So I will stick. And I will do perhaps a local shows like here yeah, where I live. There's a Christmas show. So this is something what I'll do from time to time. But it, it depends a little bit. Like sometimes I'm too busy and I don't have time to work up a smaller show. So I stick with my trade show where I know I get enough business to keep me busy. And also, since your sales are all coming from shows, if you're a little light, then you just go find a show to go to, it sounds like. I could. This is something which I haven't done. But it's like, if there's something here locally, then I'll try to do something. But like the last year, I didn't do it. The year before, I did not. Three years ago, I did. And it's always nice to go out and to talk to the end customer. Like if I go to trade show, it's always the store owners who buy the candles. And it's nice to hear to see how the retail customer reacts to the candles or what they think about it. So it would be good to do it more often, I think. Right. So Klaus, you have a similar situation like a lot of our listeners would have. And that is if you make your own product, the more you sell, the more work you're creating for yourself. So how do you manage on the production end being able to level out the sales that are coming in with the time it takes to produce the product? The only way I can do it, I have to make more molds. If I get more orders in, you have to imagine if I make a candle, I have 20, 30 molds for a shape, at least to make it efficiently. So if I get more orders in, then I'll try to add on to my mold count so I can get it out a little bit faster. I always try to find new ways to make it better. I know I have turning tables here, so it's easier to pour. I always try to tweak it to make it a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient. So this is something what comes out of my mechanical engineer nature, so that I'll try to do it a little bit differently. And I have ideas to make it really more efficient, easier, but it costs quite a bit more money. So I'll stick with the simple solutions at the end. Yeah, there you go. It's an issue. I think it's with if you're really successful, then at some point, I think you have to decide how you like to do it because it means either you really step completely out and have somebody else making your product, which I don't want to do. So I really like what we talked before. I go to the trade shows and I don't do any additional advertisement. It keeps me busy. I think if I would do more, then I think I would have this situation. Like right now, I have a 1,800, 2,000 square foot where I can make the candles. I have storage units where I store my candle boxes, my raw material and stuff like this. But if I would grow, then it would mean I would need to expand. And I think, like for me, I'm 54. I'm not so anxious anymore to have a big company over this stage in my life. So I don't want to increase because I think then you get in a completely different area. You're not anymore an artist. You're then a manufacturer. Yeah. So you really have to try to get out product as much as possible. And I think it takes out the fun. If you do it for the money, then it's great. Then you should go for it and try to make it bigger and more. But if you can make your living and you enjoy what you're doing, I think only try to tweak it so you can really make a little bit more, increase the volume what you can make, but still do it in an environment which is better for inspiring your mind, I think. If it gets too big, then you have so many other things to think about. And I think the back ends, it gets a little bit lost. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. And I've talked with other people who have virtually grown themselves out of the passion of their business, just like you're saying, because they get so big that their role ends up having to be something different. And 
part of the value of having your own business is that you want to do what you love and nothing says that you have to get bigger and grow and grow and grow and every year be making more money and all of that because you may start building something that you don't even like anymore. In fact, that you could resent. So that's a really, really important learning. And I'm glad you brought it up, Klaus, is that as business owners, we can define the size of our business and we can be successful year over year over year based on whatever goals you have. Like you're saying, as long as it's covering your cost, you're making a living, you're comfortable and you love what you're doing, that's success. Exactly. I think some people consider success only how much money you make. It has to be millions. But I think there's also there's, so success is more like a quality of life. It's for me something which is important and it has to come back into the business life. And some people I think can appreciate it. Some people don't. It's everybody's own mind, what he would like to achieve in life or what his goal is. And there's nothing right or wrong. There's only differences like with everything in life. Right. I totally agree with you. Let's talk about a challenge that you've had, Klaus, whether it's production or something as you were growing or working within the business. Can you share with us some struggle that you had and what you did to overcome it? When I started out 11 years ago, like I had one mold. And with one mold, you can make two candles a day. So there's, you can't make money with this. The first mold I had, it was a custom-made one. It was pretty expensive. So the next thing, what I was doing, I was designing my own little molds, cheap and dirty. And I make my molds not by myself. So I cut, I drill, whatever it takes. I make my molds. At the beginning, I really had to start to get my mold count up. I started out with one and now I have five, 600 modes here to make the candles and I can get some quantity out if a store comes and they would like to have a hundred candles or something. Now I can make it like when I started out, if somebody would told me, okay, he needs a hundred candles and I said, oh, okay, it's great. I like the order, but how can I achieve it? Right. Also at the beginning, like in my mind, how I started it, I didn't think about the sales. I only thought about the product or what I would like to achieve, how it should look like. And then on the sales side, I didn't put too much thought into it and to went out there. In my case, I wasn't too unhappy that it started out slow and I really could build up and I could find ways to overcome this deficiency. So it worked out at the end pretty nice then because otherwise... If I would have done it like before, I would have spent quite a bit of money on molds. And so it's for me way more efficient to do it on my own. Sure. And then you're in control because if you do get an order in for a certain shape or maybe, who knows, maybe you'll even want to do a different shape. Now you're in control of the molds. So you're able to create whatever you want, right? Exactly. So I can make a new shape and I can make only one mold that I can put it out to the show and tell them it would be ready in six months. So I can gauge a little bit the interest before I really invest time and money in 20, 30 molds. Yeah, you're in control. I think the more you can control within your business and not have to rely on others, the better, especially for a situation like this. The other thing is like with every business, if you start out there, it's always the cash flow. I think at the beginning, it's hard if you go to shows, shows are expensive and they're getting more and more expensive to spend the money. And I hear again and again, when I go to shows, people go to the first time and they're so disappointed because they spend a lot of money and they don't get the sales, what they hope they would get there. And they take out sometimes loans to get to the shows. And I don't know, like I'm European, I have first, I have the money before I can spend it. So it's for me important to always set you really put the money that you save up beforehand and you have a certain amount of money, you know you can live off of it and you can sustain your business for a certain while before it really has to make money and give it back to you. Yeah, and it's so less stressful and less risky too because you're not putting out money that you really need to be living on. Yeah, and also I think like most people go out and they take out a loan or something. It's even more stressful to get back and to try to pay back your loan and to make your living. I'm not the type for this. When I started my business, I had a certain amount set aside and said, this is 
the capital what I have and if it works, it works. If not, then I have to rethink what I'm doing. But I think it's important that you know success doesn't come overnight. It's, it's quite rare that people really go out there and then it will take off right away. I think it's persistence and longevity which makes the success. And I would suggest gift biz listeners too. I mean, what Klaus is talking about is perfect to go out to a show and especially your first one, that's market research. That's seeing the receptivity of your product, getting feedback. Maybe you have to tweak your product. Maybe you need to look at your pricing, that type of thing. But you don't always need to go to a big show either. You could go to a local craft fair, which is way less expensive yeah. than investments in a big show. And just to get feedback, but your point specifically about, especially in the first show, don't feel like you're going to walk away with thousands and thousands of orders or even hundreds. And if you do, that's great. But go with the intent of learning about how people are reacting to your product and just be capturing a ton of information and getting leads out, getting exposure for your product. The other thing Klaus, I'm so glad you talked about this. And I agree with you. I run my businesses the same way is if I don't have the money, I don't buy it. And it's just much easier. You can sleep well at night. You might grow slower. You've been talking about slow and steady growth up to a point that you like, that you feel comfortable with. Way better than being stressed out about can you pay that charge card bill or something. It's not worth it. You want your energy focused on your business and growth, not on how are you going to pay the bills, because then you also start to look desperate to a customer. Yeah. And then you'll be tempted to lower your pricing too, which is, that's no good either. So, all right, let's carry on a little bit here and talk about, you've mentioned that there are two of you in the business, right? Yes. Can you share with us the roles that each of you play? You know, the second person, she does the packaging because the boxing up, it's extremely important in our case. We sell a lot to museum stores and the candles are fragile. They can break. So we have nice boxes. There are sturdy boxes in this case. So she does mostly this side of the business. So I'll make the candles. I'll do the shows. I do the sales. And she does the other end. It takes a long time. A lot of people underestimate this end of business, making something like pouring a candle. It goes quick, but then taking it out and then having it put in a box and folding the box, stamping the box, all of this takes a lot of time. So she is in charge of this and she also she makes candles if we have too many orders in-house. So she, we are cross-trained. She can key in orders. She can call customers. But mostly what she does is getting the candles ready and to be shipped to the customers. Perfect. That's great. Just to understand a little back of the house and how things are set up there. Is there, as you get into and you think about the full running of your business, because there's also bookkeeping and website, all that crazy stuff, but is there some type of an application or tool that you use so that you stay organized within your business? I don't have any tools or something like I have a tool like accounting. I use QuickBooks. I think this is quite industry standards that most people Mm -hmm. It's for the same for the accounting with QuickBooks. It's an easy, you only give your information to your accountant and he does the taxes. But otherwise, like with website or something, I have a, an acquaintance. She, if I need something for the website, I'll give it to her. Like at the beginning, I tried to do the website, but you spend so much time doing it. And it's, there's so much change in it. It's better you have somebody who knows what they're doing and they can do it in a couple of hours instead of you doing it and it takes you a couple of weeks. This is with certain things, stick what you can do really well and the rest, try to find an affordable way to find somebody who can do it for you. This is how I organize my business around this. I think I try to do as much as I can, but I try to stick to the core business and everything what's uh, surrounding. I try to find somebody who can help me with it. Totally agree with you. That's a great way to do it. Any final advice for people who are listening today and they're getting excited, they want to get started? You've already given us a lot of tips, but any final thoughts and advice for someone who's just starting out or has maybe gotten their toe wet, have a little bit started a business, but it hasn't really gotten traction yet? What advice would you have? For me, it's like the same in my case, persistency, persistency, persistency. 
if you like what you're doing, if you believe in your product, give it a chance. Be smart about it. Don't run up debt to it, but otherwise go out there, talk to customers, see what they like or dislike with your product, and then give it some time. If it's something completely new, people have to get used to it. And it takes a while to get into the market. It takes a while to find your customer base. Like with the candles, they're contemporary. So it's a niche product. So it took five, six years where I said, okay, now the business is a stage where I think I can live with it. I would like to grow it a little bit more, but it's completely fine for me. So I think it's the same if you have something, give it some time. If you have the financial means, try to get out there. And I think you have to spend time on the business. Like at the beginning, I reinvested all the money back into the business. So I didn't take anything out. Like what I said, I had a certain amount of money set aside. And this was my business money or living money. And this came back. Whatever I made in the business, I put back in the business to grow it, to get to a point where I can say, now I can take money out and I can live comfortably and I have enough money to pay for the shows, for the raw material, for boxes, whatever I need. So there is always money in the bank account of the business, but I also I can pull money out for the daily needs I have. So slow and steady growth. And then also don't stop too soon. <laughs> you know, it might take some time. Don't get over anxious in this day and age where we expect everything in half a second. That's not necessarily how it's going to go, how it's going to play out. So now I'm going to ask you, Klaus, to dare to dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box? Oh, in my box would be a teleportation device. Oh, where are you going? I'm from Austria. My family is still over there, so it would be nice this second to be here in the U.S., the next second to be over there for a birthday party or something. Like my daughter goes to college in Scotland, so it would be nice to have this device and to go there. My other daughter, she's in Austin, Texas. So it's we are spread out, and I like to travel. For me, it's something later on I really would like to see the world. It would be really nice to go to different cultures to explore the world. This is what my dream would be. It's so nice to meet different people, to get different ideas, different aspects of life. Right. And to actually be there and be there with them and be able to see the world because there's so much out there, like you said. And you know more than anyone being from Austria and then coming here. There's so much in the world that it offers us. So I love that dream. That's fabulous. And I know for now, you're using the current device that we have, which is Skype, right? <laughs> we were talking about that before, that you Skype all the time, because that's one way to stay connected. Exactly. No, Skype is a good way to get connected or stay connected with my family. And we didn't have that 20 years ago, even. So we're halfway there to your dream, Klaus. <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the best way for people to get in touch with you would probably be to go and look at your website, right? Yes, it's the best way to go to the website. There is a contact form on there. If you'd like to know something, shoot me an email. It's the easiest way. Like I tell my customers, you can call here. It's fine. But most of the time, it will go to voicemail because we are busy. When we're making candles, we can't stop and say, no, I have to take a phone call. But we'll call back and the easiest way to get a hold of us via website, sending us an email and we'll answer our emails. There's no doubt about this. Perfect. Well, Gift Biz listeners, you know, as always, there'll be a show notes page. So I'll have links over there and lots of detail of the conversation because... Klaus, you have shared with us such really solid business building tips that I want people to listen to this a couple of times, especially if you're just starting out, because really important points were brought up and discussed here that I think we can all remember as we're moving forward. So Klaus, I'm a candle lover just like you, as you know, because this is the theme of the show, right? So I just want to thank you once again for being here, for sharing all of your wisdom, giving us a little peek behind the scenes of your business, and may your candle always burn bright. Thank you so much. That's a wrap, Gift Biz listeners. 
Thank you for joining in today, and I have a question for you. Is there an industry or some topic that you're challenged with within your business that could be good for guidance for me on who you want to see me interviewing on this show? If you have any thoughts on that, or you just want to reach out for me for any reason, feel free to email me, sue at giftbizunwrapped.com. Today's show is sponsored by the Ribbon Print Company. Looking for a new income source for your gift business? Customization is more popular now than ever. Brand your products with your logo or print a happy birthday Jessica ribbon to add to a gift right at checkout. It's all done right in your shop or craft studio in seconds. Check out the ribbonprintcompany.com for more information. After you listen to the show, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to jump over and subscribe to the show on iTunes. That way you'll automatically get the newest episodes when they go live. And thank you to those who have already left a rating and review. By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, you help to increase the visibility of Gift Biz Unwrapped. It's a great way to pay it forward to help others with their entrepreneurial journey.